Services presents the commission. Hi, everyone. I'm going to say a couple words to start just to catch everyone up. So this is Focus Locus Presents. Uh, we are a weekly show uh, that is generally for local filmmakers to show their work and do a talk back. Uh, we sort of transitioned from Focus Locus, which is an in-person project to give local filmmakers a chance to workshop with other filmmakers uh, into this remote version. Um, so this is our eighth episode in which we are expanding that definition uh, from local film to include uh, theater between addresses. And hopefully we'll continue to expand that definition as um, you know, we continue to need to use and, and adapt uh, to new forms of content creation uh, while being far apart. Um, anyway, so Theater Between Addresses uh, is a constellation of theater artists and writers working together to foster, workshop, and produce new work brought together out of a necessity for connection and creative outlet. This collective produces original theater for the end of the world. Uh, so tonight we will be premiering two radio plays from Theater Between Addresses. Um, yeah, if you're watching and you have questions at any point, we're gonna play the plays, play the plays, and then we are going to do a talk pack, talk back afterwards, which will probably be at about set, uh, just about eight. So if you have questions, throw them in the chat at any point. Um, I'll be taking notes, I'll be taking questions, and yeah, stick around and, and hear answers from people. So without further ado, let's get started. Theater Between Addresses presents The Canary by Abigail Weaver, directed by Kathy Kennedy, sound design by Sean Frenchburn, featuring the vocal talents of Zoe Nadig as the narrator, Janine Florence Jacinto as Toiba, Issy Brown as Audler, Zoe Margolis as Computero, and Icarus Tyree as the Canary. Prologue. Listen to the hummingbird whose wings you cannot see. Listen to the hummingbird, don't listen to me. Listen to the butterfly whose days but number three. Listen to the butterfly, don't listen to me. Listen to the mind of God, which doesn't need to be. Listen to the mind of God, don't listen to me. Leonard Cohen. Chapter one, a room of crow, no windows. By the wall, a hydroponic garden. Absurdly large vegetables and flowers grow under white light. Otherwise, the room is dark. A faint electronic hum emits from a satellite dish. Barely noticeable over this, computeral hums and unearthly song. Toiba, a young woman with one eye, enters yawning. She strokes the fronds of a large fern. Good morning, little fern. All the lights in the room were on. Good morning, Toiba. Oh, computer roll. I didn't realize you were up. Did the captain turn you on? Captain Audler is still asleep. She left you on all night? <laughs> Typical. I woke myself up at this morning. You can do that now? You're so smart. I like to rise early. Early morning. What does that mean to you anyway? You've never seen a morning early compared to what? Your coffee is ready. Toiba opens a panel in the wall and takes out a steaming mug of coffee. That's kind of you. Who told you to anticipate my needs? Would you like to hear the canary? Yes, I was just gonna ask. I should transplant these tomatoes today. I can't believe how big they've gotten. As Computeral speaks, Toiba tenderly examines her plants, writing down their statistics on a clipboard. You have five new canaries from home base today. First unheard canary, 17th September, 2240, 0-hundred hours. It's an autumn night and things could be worse. The moon is in a dime bag and it lies inside my purse. That's a pretty one. Isn't that just dreamy? Do the next one. 17 September, year 2240, 
Time, 0100. Toiba pauses her work and shuts her eyes as the canary speaks. The stars are like breadcrumbs on a bedspread night. The moon is in a dime bag and my purse is full of light. <laughs> Toiba laughs as Adler, a severe woman in her late 60s, slams in. You're having too much fun too early in the morning. Morning? What's morning a parsec and a half from the sun? Our language needs to evolve. Captain Adler, would you like to make a logbook entry for the day? I got nothing to write home about. You look horrible. Were you in the eagle's nest all night? No need to navigate. There's nothing around for light years. We'll be in the doldrums till we hit the Magellanic clouds. No, I was on the bridge, fiddling with the transmitter. No luck, I assume. It's been dead, what, six months now? <laughs> Listen to me, months. Wasn't built for a voyage like this. Well, like you said, not much to write home about. I know, but still, I don't like things to stay broken. Why keep fussing with it? As long as we can still receive transmissions from Earth, and our local signature is still running. Computerl, the canary. You have three unheard canaries. 17 September, year 2240, time 0200. Only fools and heroes live life undisguised. The terror of the wise man leaves him paralyzed. These jerks. Captain! What? That pretentious BS never makes any sense. It's poetry. If that's poetry to you, shows how little you know. It's not the canary's job to be clever. They must have a lot of time on their hands down on Earth. Wish they'd just ping us like they used to. Why don't you go to sleep? I'll listen to the canaries. I actually enjoy it. Even nonsense is better than silence. Computerl, continue. 17 September, year 2240, time 0300. Night creeps on like ink across a page. Sharper than a knife is the peacock's rage. Those jerks. Toyba, who do you think writes I these? A man or a woman? I love you. Are you talking to your plants? I read this old article about a Japanese scientist. He kept three bowls of cooked rice all in the same fridge. To the first, he would lavish blessings and kind words every day for a month. And at the second, he would curse and rage. And to the third, his control variable, he said nothing at all. After a month, the first one is still good enough to eat but the second was mired with rot, totally inedible. I'd never eat month-old rice, even if someone really loved it. So the scientist proved then that when someone tells you that they love you, it heals your body at a cellular level. It regenerates organic matter. I I'm, I'm worried about my plant specimens. The effects of space time have artificially lengthened their lives, just like it has ours. But what's happening to their cells? Pseudoscience. I thought you were a serious biologist. I love you. I love you. I love you. Ugh. Computerl, continue. 17 September, year 2240. Time, 0400. If you want to hear the word, let the word transform. Fly out before us, birds before the storm. What was that? Computerl, continue. There are no unheard transmissions from the canary. None since four in the morning? What time is it now? Uh, that's what, four hours of silence? Captain Adler, what's happening? Shut up so I can think. Did we go out of range? Maybe you messed something up on the bridge. You've never missed a transmission in how many years? 10, 20? How long have we been gone? Shut up. Do you think they forgot about us? They didn't forget. Maybe someone called in sick or fell asleep at the board. They don't get sick. They don't sleep. What do we do? Stay calm. 
We wait for another transmission. Are you serious? There could have been any number of problems with their equipment or ours. You're not breathing. Breathe. <sighs> okay. Okay. Computer roll. What time is it? 07.59. They might send us something on the hour. Would you please stop pacing? It's driving me up the wall. What time is it now? 0800. Canary incoming. 17 September, year 2240. Time, 0800. Wait, don't. Play it, play it. Hello? Hello? Who's there? Come back, come back. They've taken over. Captain? Computer, I'll take us offline. Now. Are you crazy? Cut every signal but our local radar. No, cut that too. We'll fly dark. What? Computer, I'll don't do that. Captain's orders. A brief whirring. Then the low hum present throughout suddenly goes out, as do all lights except the grow lights over the plants. Override engaged. The Edenia is offline. All communications down. We could crash. Into what? We're all alone. Ogler, just wait a minute. I don't really understand, but something bad happened, right? They're in trouble back home. The last thing we should be doing is cut our signal. We need to fix our transmission equipment and buzz them. How would you help them? Would you turn this ship around? That's not our job. Leave me, I need to think. There's someone down there, someone who's been writing to us, who's in danger. Stupid girl, your youth is no excuse. You got so pie-eyed over those little poems that you forgot why they were sending them. Well, guess what? Somewhere down there, there was a person or a committee or a freaking AI whose whole job, no, whole reason for existing was to send canaries to let us know that they are still in control down there. They weren't writing you love poems. And then they were gone. And notice I said were, because even with light-grade equipment, it still takes, what, three years for a transmission to chase us down from Earth? Three years, eight months, and four days. At this point, whatever just happened, we're three years too late to even understand, let alone help. We can only move forward in the dark. So keep your head and do your job, and I'll do mine. Three years, months, days, why even say it? Without the canary, we're cut loose from time, don't you see? You've never had a life off this ship, Toiba. We've always been alone, together. Get comfortable with it. Go talk to your plants. I'll be on the bridge. Toddler exits. Toiba paces, fiddles with a vine curling up a plant. Computer roll? Here I am. What time is it? 8.25 in the morning. Morning. How old was I when I came aboard? You were six years old, and the captain was 29. I saw a picture from then. I look about her age when she came aboard, don't I? But it's been longer than that, much longer. Time touches us differently out here. It drifts. Our cells die slower. Something about the telomeres. Why did they choose me? It was determined that you were to be a prodigy in botanical science. The mission needed a botanist. The mission? I have one memory from before, when I was very young. A spark caught in August in the woods behind my town. A great wildfire began to turn. Everyone came out of their homes to watch. No one ran, no one even spoke. Someone passed around a bucket of fried chicken for all of us to chow down on as we watched the flames. The firefighters beat it down, but the smoke stuck around for a long time, in hair and clothes. 
I still smell it on myself sometimes. It sunk into me. Or maybe it's just the memory of smoke that remains. And that's all I have left of Earth. This morning, I had the canaries. Now, I have only the memory of smoke. What do you think would happen if we turned our receiver back on? I do not think that I am allowed to answer hypotheticals. A lot can happen in three years, right? Maybe they've taken control back from these slippers, or maybe they're playing a prank on us. Don't you want to find out? I do not think that I want things like you do. There must still be someone down there. Anyone. They wouldn't just disappear like that. Can you peek into the internal heat signature and tell me where Captain Aldler is right now? She is on the bridge. She is kneeling on the floor. I am not really sure what she is doing. Oh. Well, she'll be glad to realize that this was all one big nothing. What time is it? Almost nine in the morning. Turn on the receiver. I think we'll be hearing from them. Come on. Do it. Okay. The low hum stutters on again. Anything yet? No. Wait. There's someone there! No! Computer all full dark now! Toiba, you have no idea what a fool you've just been. How can you not want to know? I have to know. What if our people have taken control back? What if they're worried about us? When the canaries stop singing, we cut ourselves off. If there's still anyone down there, they know that's the way. If the others know that we're up here, it could destroy the mission. Destroy us. We're much too far for them to care. If they think we're still out here, they'll send someone after us. It would take years, but they'd catch up. They have about 60 years of tech advancement on us, and we aren't exactly a warship. You just sent a beacon to them. Let's hope no one noticed. You don't understand what this means to me. I've lost everything. I've lost the canary. I've seen a lot more of Earth than you ever did. All you know of it is the little beauty the canary brought you, us. But that beauty conveys meaning. And the canary is pure binary meaning. Yes or no. We can't jeopardize the mission for the loss of that beauty. Meaning? Maybe they all meant something, all the poems. Maybe it was code. What was the last thing it said? Befo birds before the storm. It was nothing. It was just to entertain. I should have explained that to you. Because now you might have ruined everything. Computer. Here I am, Captain. I'm initiating human interference mode. From now on, you answer only to the Captain. You interface only with me. No. Human interference mode initiated. Computer roll. Computer roll, please. Can it see me? What did you do? I can't have you two conspiring against me with our lives at stake. And the mission. The mission? What's the mission anyway? What's so important? They told us we were going into the big nothing with a handful of seeds and a canary. In a time of upheaval, they sent us away in secret. Be safe with the last words spoken to me on Earth. So are we running to or running from? There's something you aren't telling me. I swear I don't know any more than you do. Then why are you in charge? Because I remember what solid ground smells like and what kind of clouds have rain in them and how real, fresh, breathable air feels in your lungs. Because we can't keep on forever, and I'm the only one of us who knows when to stop. But I remember how Earth feels. I remember smoke. From the forest fire? That's not your memory. I told you that story years ago when you were young. You weren't there. When you left Earth, you were really too young to remember anything. You don't remember smoke. You remember the memory of smoke.
but I can feel it. I even still smell it on my clothes. What you smell right now is what you think it's supposed to smell like. No, I, I, I d don't believe you. Yes, you do. Then, then if I don't remember and Computer Old doesn't remember, well, I don't think she remembers the things the way humans do. She? And the plants don't remember because they were seeds. Who's to say it ever happened? Earth. If you're telling the truth, I only have your word for it. I could never tell a lie as big as the earth. Did you write the canaries? Did you invent this, all of this? For what reason? I don't know, to control me, to hurt me. You think I would invent the world for you? You think you matter that much to me? Listen. There's evil, evil that you don't understand because the worst of it isn't on this ship or in these big nothing doldrums. The canary sang out from solid ground and again and again proved to us that it still exists, but evil creeps like fog around that beacon. The others are not us. They are something you can't understand, but you should nonetheless know to fear. I promise there is nothing that I've kept from you. It wouldn't be worth the effort. Toiba snatches Audler's hat off her head and throws it on the ground between them. What's this? I'm challenging you for captaincy. Don't be ridiculous, Toiba. When I'm captain, I'll order Computer World to reopen our signal to Earth. I'll fix our transmission equipment. Whatever is down there, we'll hear what it has to say for itself. You've proven yourself a fool too many times today. You said it yourself. Even nonsense is better than silence. So anything is better than silence. Open the gates to hell. It's worth it just to hear a living word. And I'll tell you what's more about that Japanese scientist. The what? The Japanese scientist with the bowls of rice. The one he blessed remained fresh and the one he cursed crusted over with mold. But do you know what happened to the third bowl of rice, which he didn't speak to at all? Well, it rotted from the inside out. It turned to toxic goop, totally unrecognizable. Because even hate, even evil is better than nothing. And that's what will happen to us without the canary. Whatever the canary means now, we'll become a hunk of something poisonous, drifting in space. Forever. There's nothing for it, is there? You remember what happened the last time you dueled me? This time I'll beat you. I'm ready when you are. Computerl? Yes, Captain Odler. Initiate dueling sequence. Select a level. Expert. Select a song. Randomize it. Lights shift to something reminiscent of the bubblegum pop colors of the Just Dance video game. Toiba and Audler shuck off their jackets. The clothes underneath echo futuristic Bowie-esque dancewear. Squares light up on the floor, Dance Dance Revolution style. Dueling sequence commences in three, two, one, Audler and Toiba face forward, side by side, and launch into an identical dance routine. LEDs light up in their hands, feet, knees, and elbows under the disco light. They start out neck and neck, dancing up a storm. When they execute a move well, a bright green check mark glows over them with a little ding. When they miss one, a red X appears and a nasty beat. As the dance continues, Audler's stamina flags. The dance ends. Audler and Toiba gasp for breath, hands on their knees. Toiba with three green check marks over her head. Audler with three red X's. I won. I won. Computer roll? Yes, Captain Toiba. <laughs> Toiba puts on the hat. Take us online. A hum starts up. The Edinia is online. Someone is trying to reach you from Earth. 
But it's not 10 o'clock yet, is it? It's 9.39 in the morning. Static crackles from the satellite dish. The signal is strong. It must be urgent. The canary comes every hour on the dot. It's not the canary. Someone on Earth might have something important to say. The most important thing they've ever said, or... She glances to Adler for help, who avoids her gaze. The static grows louder. Choose. I... I... I remember something. Cold silk running through my hands, filling up my nose and mouth and ears like static. I was in the ocean once. Odler, I order you as your captain to tell the truth. Have you ever been in the ocean? No, I lived inland. That must be one of your memories. Four years old, maybe five, running towards the sea, and when the wave crashed ashore, I jumped and let it carry me, let myself flow. I could smell the salt in my clothes. But why is the memory coming back now? Because I'm about to jump again. She seizes a pair of hedge trimmers from by the plant and bashes in the satellite dish. The static ceases. Do you know who you are now? Yes. Do you know where you're going? No. Do you know where you come from? Yes. It's mine to know. I I do. I didn't know I could make the world new. Chapter two. The plants are significantly larger, and there are more of them, taking over much of the room. Toya is much older now. She sits in a rocking chair with a blanket over her lap. That was the day we stopped running and began wandering. That day we left behind what was no longer ours, took our memories off life support to move towards something we could hope to someday touch. And now the Magellanic clouds spread before us, 200,000 light years away from where I was a little girl pulled under a wave. How many years has it been? You asked me to stop keeping time, Captain Toiba. Remember? You're right. I'm sorry. Things are a little slippery lately. But what could I do? Without the canaries to anchor ourselves, we came unmoored from time. When things change again, we'll keep time once more. And they will change again. You just voiced an opinion, unprompted. Who taught you to do that? We have been together for a long time. There is a lot that I still don't know about myself. I was created for a mission, which we abandoned, or maybe have yet to complete. But I'm learning about change. I saw a seed turn into an apple tree. I saw the old captain die before we stopped keeping time. I thought I could not change until I realized I was changing slowly, learning from you. You're remarkable, you curious thing. Captain, there's something on the radar, a vessel riding in our direction out of the Magellanic clouds. So we're out of the doldrums after all. Who could it be? It might be a fellow traveler. Or some pursuer from Earth, dogging us since the day the canary died, finally catching up. So should we go dark? No. Fly them down. I didn't destroy it, you know, to hide from where we came from. I did it so we can start seeking. I cut away the anchor and the waves took us far, far. Plug them down. I want to ask them what time it is. <sighs> I've been so tired lately. I suppose we have some time before they're within range. So I'll get a little beauty sleep if you don't mind before I see another living soul. Toiba curls up and dozes off. Captain Toiba? Captain? 
It's night. You see, I really do understand what night and morning are. Night is when she sleeps, and morning is when she wakes up. The wall opens, revealing a bay window. Out of the window, the Magellanic clouds hang glittering. From far off, a light twinkles into existence and zooms closer. The end of this long nothing is upon us. We sail into a big something, where only love can shine a light, where we speak the world into existence. This is what I say to her when she sleeps. I love you. I love you. I love you. Dear listeners, before we present the second half of our double feature tonight, I have a mutual aid opportunity I'd like to share with you. The Trans Asylum Seekers Network, or TASSN, TASSN, is a collective working to get trans asylum seekers out of ICE detention and helping them access support. TASSN is a grassroots anarchist collective, not part of the nonprofit industrial complex, with chapters in New Jersey, Arizona, and right here in Western Mass. Asylum seekers are not allowed to work until they get a lawyer and a work permit, which now takes over a year at minimum. All money donated to TASSEN is directly distributed to Compañeras to help them cover rent, clothing, furniture, food, makeup and wigs, hormones, transportation, legal fees, health care, therapy, remittances, classes, and so much more. TASSEN is currently supporting 26 trans and queer asylum seekers long term in all of the aforementioned ways, as well as emotional support, community, rideshare, and more. So if you're enjoying the show tonight, please show your love by donating to Tassin at givebutter.com slash T-A-S-S-N. You can make a one-time donation or set up a recurring donation to help them meet their monthly goal of $12,000. That's givebutter.com slash T-A-S-S-N. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. Love, theater between addresses. Theater Between Addresses presents Oracular Therapy by Samuel Achilles Edwards Directed by Abigail Weaver Sound Design by Jean-Marie French Byrne With Carrot O'Brien as the therapist and Pira Varela as Cassandra You know, it's really exhausting. I feel like nobody listens to me, like I'm screaming into the void. I keep saying all these things and having people just think, oh, Cassandra's crazy. Who told you that you're crazy? Nobody told me, but I can tell they think it just from how they look at me. Nobody wants to be around me anymore. They say I'm too real or too deep. They all want to be around some charismatic hunk like Paris. Or Hector, who gets along with everybody, but would rather go to war than tell our brother, hey, maybe kidnapping this random famous woman in Greece is a bad idea. Can you imagine that? Being so conflict avoidant, you'd go to war before you'd tell someone you love they're acting like a fucking moron? Sounds counterintuitive. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. And I just know it's going to lead to his death. It's going to bring the death of our whole damn city. And I can't do anything. I just have to watch while it all happens and falls apart around me. This sounds like an anxiety spiral. 
Use your breathing techniques, Cassandra. Is it still an anxiety spiral if it's true? Yes, because it's about how you feel. Having a panic attack isn't going to help you regardless of whether it's true or not. You're right. And I have to consider how I say it. That's what Hector told me the other day. He was like, you might be right, but can you say it in an easier way? And I was like, how the fuck can I say it in an easy way? It's the destruction of my entire fucking life and everyone I love and everything I care about. Watch your breath, Cassandra. <sighs> yes. Yes, okay. Thank you. It's just, I don't know how to say it differently because when I try to be subtle about it, no one listens to me either. Maybe they can't let themselves hear it. But if they won't let themselves hear it and do something about it, then it's just going to happen. I'm trying to change our fucking fates. You can't change other people or make them listen to you. We've talked about that. I know, I know. But gods, what kind of horrible person would I be if I knew all this and didn't say anything? It keeps me up at night. The fire, the screaming, the faces of my friends and family burning to ash. How can I keep all that inside of me? It's not as if I like to be the bearer of bad news. It's not as if I enjoy telling people their whole life is going to be destroyed. But I have to say something so that it gets out of my head and maybe someone else will be able to do something. What if you didn't tell them? What if you kept it in your head? Then I'd just sit by the sidelines and watch, knowing I could have said something, but I didn't. At least this way I can say I tried. That makes sense. And how are you saying it to them? At first, I try to be gentle, but they don't hear me. So I get a little more agitated and say something a little too blunt. Then I get to the point where I just can't stand it anymore, and I just rip at my hair and scream at the top of my lungs, You're gonna die! You're gonna fucking die! Listen to me! And I know it scares people, I know it does, I can see how they look afraid, and I don't like it, but I just need them to see. Why do you need them to see? So that maybe then I won't be so fucking alone in it. I'm just sick of being powerless and alone. At least if everyone had to live like this, we'd be together in it. But if you give them the information, even if they choose to ignore it, aren't you still together in it? I guess so, but I just want them to do something. You can't control what other people do with the information, Cassandra. What can you do? Nothing. I have no power, no control, no influence. I'm just the crazy girl. That's not true, Cassandra. You've already said you're doing some things, tearing at your hair, screaming at them. It seems like when you do that, you don't feel heard like you want to. What else can you do? I don't even know. It's not like I can go to war, and I don't think it'd change anything if I did. Hector's going to war, and that's not going to do anything. It's just going to end up with him dead, strapped to the back of a chariot like he's not even human, thrown away like garbage that vultures will feed on. Cassandra, you're breathing. You're right. You're right. This thing just seems so much larger than anything one person can do. You're probably right. It's complex with a lot of moving parts. But that can give you some relief too. It's not just on you to fix it all. But I'm the person who knows. You're not the only person who knows, Cassandra. You've been telling lots of people. They just aren't doing what you want them to. I guess you're right. But gods, it's infuriating. 
it'd be great if I was like Zeus or Hera or, or even Apollo and could just sway things in a certain way. Even the gods don't have total control. All beings have agency over their own lives. But what about things that are fated, that just have to happen? Maybe you can't change fate, but you can change how you deal with it. What are other ways you could deal with this? I don't know. When I've tried to say it in subtle ways, nobody listens. But when I've tried to say it in loud ways, nobody listens either. Maybe they are listening, and they feel just as lost as you do. What you're saying is heavy, Cassandra. A lot of people can't deal with that. I know it's heavy. I can't deal with it either. Gods, I'd love to just be stupid. To be a meathead like Paris, never thinking beyond today. Think of the damage Paris has done. His actions caused an entire war. Do you really want to be like that? <laughs> at least he sleeps well at night. But many others don't because of the consequences of his actions. Nobody sleeps well because of what I'm saying either. That's what Hector said. He said, what you've been talking about has been giving me nightmares, Cassandra. I can't even think about it. It makes me sick. Does that sound like someone who isn't hearing you? I guess he is hearing me, but he's not doing anything. He's tightly involved in the situation, Cassandra. Paris is his brother. It's hard to just cut that tie. He is my brother too, and I would cut ties with him. Have you? Well, no. Why not? Because I want him to listen to me, but he just won't. You know, the last time I tried to talk to Paris, he said, these hysterics again? I can't hold your feelings, Cassandra. Like we don't all hold his feelings all the damn time. This whole war is about the consequences of his feelings, but he can't even listen to another person for 15 fucking minutes. That sounds very frustrating. It is. He always calls me sensitive. Oh, Cassandra, you're so sensitive. I can't deal with your breakdown. Well, I can't deal with you breaking down my fucking life. What would be the reaction you'd want from Paris? Just, I don't know. Leave me alone. Leave my city alone. Leave my family alone. Let Helen go back to Sparta and just leave. He wouldn't have much left after that. That seems like a harsh vision of justice. Well, sometimes life is harsh. Like when your city is about to burn to the fucking ground because of your idiot brother's stupid decisions. Remember to go back to your breath, Cassandra. You know, when we were kids, Paris and I used to be close. We would spend all day pretending to be gods and heroes. It just drives me insane that he would do something like this. It sounds like you feel betrayed by Paris. Have you told him that? Not in so many words. But it's not like he'd listen to me if I did anyway. I just can't believe he kidnapped her. What makes me and Helen different? Well, he grew up with you, and he has a relationship with you. Yes, but how am I supposed to be around him when I know he's capable of this? What if you weren't around him for a while? It seems like you want him to leave, but what if you were the one to remove yourself from the situation? But I just want to get through to him. Sometimes, you have to take space from people, to let it sink in for them. And it doesn't sound like talking to Paris about this is improving the situation. Absolutely not. So maybe you need to let it rest, just for now. But how can I let it rest? It's just so unjust and crazy and wrong. You're right. It really is unjust and crazy, and wrong. At least someone acknowledges it. Do you believe me? 
that this is going to happen? Why is it important that I believe you? Because I want to know someone hears me. I certainly hear you. But do you believe me? I mean, you live in Troy. This would affect you too. If I did believe you, what would you want me to do? I don't know. I guess you can't do anything. Maybe that's the problem. I just want to change things somehow because I keep thinking, this can't be the end. This can't be how it ends. It can't be. It's not the end yet. It might as well be. I see the ending every night. But there's a lot of moments between now and then, Cassandra. And you only have control over this moment. I just... I just want to believe someone's going to rescue me. Someone's going to look out for me. But no one will. Not a god like Apollo. Not a hero like Hector. Everywhere I look, doors just keep closing. How are you going to look out for yourself? I don't even know what that means. I need support, not an inspirational quotation. But I mean it. What if you just looked at everything and said, here's what I know. What am I going to do now? Knowing that no one is going to be able to listen to you because they're caught up in their own story. What then? I don't know. Maybe that's what you should investigate. I guess if I'm not looking at anyone else, I just... Oh, God, I don't know. You're not committing to anything right now. I guess I'd just... I'd leave Troy? But what about everyone else? I have to rescue them. The house is burning down and they're in it. You've given them the information they need. Whether they listen to you or not, whether they believe you or not, whether they act on that information, that's their choice. You can't control that, but you can control yourself. If what you're saying is true, they'll know eventually. But in the meantime, you can plan based on what you know, not what they know. And rest easy knowing you try to give them all the information. I'm just sure there's some way to make them hear it. If I can just keep twisting my words around, trying different angles, eventually they'll be able to hear me. Something will connect. Maybe they can't hear it. Maybe this is just something they need to see for themselves. But by then it'll probably be too late. Not everyone can listen to a litany of how their life is going to be destroyed, even when it's true. Maybe especially when it's true. But if someone foresaw my death and the death of everyone around me, I'd want them to tell me. Not everyone values transparency like you do. You're the only one that you can make act in line with your values. Do you feel like you're acting in line with your values? Mostly, I think. I don't always like when I scream at someone about how they're going to die, because that scares them, and I don't think it gets through to them. What I've been hearing you say throughout this is that you need to find a new approach, because your current one isn't working for you or other people. I don't know what else to do. Maybe pick one or two points you want to make, and deliver them as calmly and simply as possible. Then be done with it. That's it? That's it. We can practice right now if you like. Imagine I'm Hector, and say to me what you would say to him. <sighs> okay, I can do this. You can do this, Cassandra. Hector? Troy is going to be destroyed, and you're going to be killed, and your body will be dragged behind a chariot and be completely unrecognizable. I see flesh peeling off and- Okay, okay, graphic. If I'm Hector, I've already tuned out by dragged behind a chariot. 
because I'm more distracted by your panicked energy and the graphic imagery than internalizing what you're saying. You're right. You're right. Try again. Use this as your laboratory. Okay. I can do this. Hector, Troy is going to be destroyed and you're going to be killed. Okay, that's your opinion, Cassandra. It's not an opinion, it's a vision. I don't believe that's going to happen. But I can see it. I can see the flames and your rotting flesh being dragged through the dirt and the sword going through you and... Do you think telling him more gory details will convince him? Ugh, probably not. Okay, do you want to try again? Yes, let's do it again. Hector, Troy is going to be destroyed, and you're going to be killed. Okay, that's your opinion, Cassandra. It's not an opinion, it's a prophecy. I don't believe it is. Well, you can believe whatever you want. That's what I know. How did that feel? Amazing! Really? It's so great to be confident and to not be begging him to hear me. Right. So you're getting your goal, to get the information to him. But whether he accepts it or not is up to him. And I know what's true. Exactly. There's confidence and power in knowing your truth, even if no one else knows. You're right. Thank you. I'll see you this time next week. I'm not sure if you will. I mean, I don't know when all this is going to happen. What? I don't know when Troy is going to burn down. It could be next week for all I know. Let's plan on next week. Okay, we'll plan on it. I just got done with work for the day. I'll be heading home in about five minutes. I don't know. I'm feeling strange. I have this client, and she feels like Troy is going to be destroyed. She said it could happen as soon as next week. She's intent on it. She has all these visions about it, and she sees it in complete detail. Total carnage. All the people in Troy burning to death. Yes, but it is completely plausible. I can't tell her she's delusional. There is a war going on. It's absolutely something that could happen. You mean it isn't affecting our lives yet? It just feels like there's nothing we can do. That's what's scary about it. You're right. I guess I am doing some things. I'm doing my best. And I really am trying to help her. Thank you. I love you. I'll see you soon. Theater Between Addresses presents The Canary by Abigail Weaver, directed by Kathy Kennedy, sound design by Sean Frenchburn, featuring the vocal talent.
Okay, uh, so we are now live. We got a couple of people joining. Um, so just as a sort of an introduction, thank you everyone who tuned in to Focus Locus Theater Between Addresses. addresses. That is two radio plays from the group. Uh, this was their premiere, so that's very exciting. Um, if you haven't sent any questions that you want to ask this team, we have a bunch of people here. Uh, we have the two playwrights, Sam and Abby, um, who I have a bunch of questions for. And we also have Sean, who did the sound design for both of these, and Ash, who I'm trying to remember what Ash did. A lot of people. Ash. Ash. Ash, what is your role in these two? <laughs> I, I, I am just a group member of Theater Between Addresses. I help run the social media, and I am just here to be excited with everybody about our premiere. Perfect. Speaking of which, here's Ezekiel. We got a lot of people coming in. So um, this is going to be kind of casual because there's so many of us, and we have a lot to talk about. Um, but I wanted to, to begin by just asking, um, how did Theater Between Addresses, how did this project come to be? Anyone can answer. <laughs> Abby? Um, hi, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, <laughs> yay. Yeah, Theater Between Addresses started as um, just a big group text that I sent because I like like many playwrights um, had a premiere scheduled in April of a uh, two new plays that was canceled and I was very sad about that and then um, I learned from Ezekiel and Sean who are also in this group and with us tonight because um, they were working on a, a project that started off uh, to be a reading that we were all going to do in real life and then it turned into Zoom and that's how I kind of learned that it's possible to keep making stuff and connecting and being with people um, and that new things don't have to stop being new and being things. Um, so I just like texted a bunch of people and said, if like, I have all these scripts, if I were to like somehow adapt them for radio, like, would you want to figure out how to do that with me? So I then, as we like more and more people came with scripts and came with talents and we kind of all are figuring out the medium together and uh, it just kind of started very loosely and incidentally like that and it's been like that since, which has been very fun. Yay, does anyone else wanna add? <laughs> it's okay if not, this is kind of, I know this is so funny. Um, because Zoom meetings still, like, kind of are not conducive to conversation. But um, yeah, so it's a really awesome project. And were these the first two things that you all worked on sort of officially or was there anything else before? <laughs> Sam, you wanna? I think um, various people on uh, Theater Between Addressive have worked with each other on other projects, which is kind of part of what brought us together, but this is the first like theater between addresses like release. Great. This is definitely the first thing since the meeting where we came up with the name by generating a like, hundred names and then picking this one. <laughs> and we've all like workshopped scripts with each other before, like over the years um, or months or however long we've known each other. This has been kind of like a loose workshopping group for a while. Great. So um, I guess one more sort of broad question and then we can dive into the canary and oracular therapy, um, which is what has been, obviously sort of the theater between address, addresses mission statement itself kind of hints to this, but like the radio play thing has really been like a way to address um, not being able to do stage plays right now. And you also said this in your answer to my first question, Abby. So what has been the approach to radio plays versus, versus stage plays? Have you guys been enjoying it? Um, are, you things, are there things that you miss? Are there things that you wish you could have on stage? I don't know, let me know. <laughs> Oh, 
Um, yeah, I think that I think the only person in in this group who has done who, or who's here in this little Zoom who's done any kind of audio drama before is Sean, um, who has this amazing uh, episode of these like it's a story of people who are on, they're on a boat and it's great um, that they can maybe talk about. But I um, yeah I miss live theater a lot, um, but I think that. Yeah, it's it's like a it's like you kind of have to like do a little more work to get people to see it, I guess. Obviously, um, so it feels kind of more like writing, writing prose or like writing for um, the page. I don't know. We're all like, yeah, figuring out the medium, like kind of as we go. Um, so I'm excited to like figure out like what works for radio that like doesn't work for you, the stage. Um, definitely some of the stuff we were doing in Canary with the, the distortion uh, felt really exciting for that. That was, that's a new opportunity. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited to talk with Sean about sound design, um, especially, but let's start with the Canary just um, okay, so let's let's do kind of a. I'm like Sam is on this side of my Zoom and Abby's on this side, so I'm like let's kind of because we just watch two things or listen to two things, so I feel like instead of doing one at a time, let's gonna let's kind of ask the same questions and you know. Um, so, can you tell me about uh, how this concept concept came to be? I know Abby, you started writing the Canary pre-pandemic. I don't know Sam when you started writing Oracular Therapy. So let's what is the what is the genesis of these projects? Let's start with Sam because Abby just talked also. <laughs> yeah, um, so I did actually surprisingly start writing this pre-pandemic. A lot of people have been like, "Oh, this must be about the pandemic." It wasn't originally. Um, originally, it was just about. Uh, kind of dealing with toxic dynamics in groups and trying to figure out like when you have a problem and addressing that with other people that was what I was trying to work through in myself but also I, I'm glad that it can apply to a lot of other situations that people kind of uh, feel like it resonates in these different ways um, but that was originally what I was kind of working through when I was writing it. Um, I actually started writing it last year um, I think uh, probably a year ago now, and I've been kind of working on it since then. Um, I workshopped it with um, Abby in person in February, and then it kind of started to become uh, a radio play um, in probably April, and then we've been working on it since then, and now the premiere. <laughs> um, and I think a part of it was also just uh, uh, thinking it was kind of a funny, idea to imagine this kind of uh, ancient Greek character in this very like contemporary setting of like a therapist's office and like how those kind of uh, worlds that are very different temporally kind of interact. Um, so that was kind of part of what I was thinking about. So funny for people to be like, this must be about the pandemic when it's also about, um, you know, someone who, what is the correct term for someone who has prophecies? Is it just profit? I don't know, but profit it's profit. Oracle. <laughs> oracle, yeah. So it's a it's a prophetic profit story. <laughs> All right, Abby, tell us about the canary. Um, yeah, I'll tell you about the canary. Uh, Pierre is trying to get into the Zoom. Um, someone let them in. The canary. Um, I started to write. Uh, also last year, last summer. Um. And I wrote it and I was gonna, I started writing it in Yiddish. Um, and then I thought it's hard to write it in a second language. So I'll write it and translate it. And I haven't translated it yet and I still kind of want to, but for me, it was like a play that was about diaspora and about um, trying just uh, how different people of different ages who have different levels of connection are, are always forging and reforging um, those relationships and making a relationship instead of kind of this, this kernel of absence um, inside a person, a really generative source of memory and being and um, whatnot. Uh, 
And this is another one that people are like, oh, this is about the pandemic. Um, Cause I think it, it is like two people who are like really, really alone together um, and learning to be even more alone. Uh, but I think it maybe feels like everything is about the pandemic right now. Um, so one theme that I saw between both of these that I think we could have a cool discussion about is um, the concept of interpretation. So for uh, the characters in the Canary, they're uh, in throughout the beginning, they're arguing about the Canary messages. There's this great line about if they're poems or if they're code. Um, and I feel like for Cassandra, it's it's these incredibly violent, gory images entering her head. And then the same way she's sort of trying to trying to decide if they're like, like the way that she translates them, one sense could be poetry in like the just telling people the absolute most disgusting thing that's gonna happen to them and like really giving people the truth or like creating the code, you know, like creating the translation of it. So I wanted to hear from people, um, I wanted to hear from Abby and Sam specifically, but also from everyone else, uh, thoughts about, you know, um, how both of these plays deal with uh, translation and also interpretation and also bad news, really. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great um, kind of bridge between the two plays because I think uh, a lot of it is about like, in both cases, how do you interpret information and sometimes in the case of Cassandra, it's this information that's very direct, like almost too direct. And in Canary, it's like this information that's kind of vague, which is an interesting kind of compare and contrast. Um, but I think that is a really good point. Yeah, one of the fun things about um, Canary or that, that I, I didn't, wasn't really articulating to myself until this question was about how, like the translation of like time and like how, um, yeah, there are like the, the line of like, oh, the language needs to evolve because even on the, a very basic level, the way they relate to each other um, is kind of underlaid by their relationship to earth because the way they relate to, relate to each other is based in time. And the only way they have of measuring time are like very earth centric ways. And so it's this, this also this translation and that everything goes back to earth, but it also it can't because that connection isn't really there anymore. It's um, yeah, difficult for them to translate that. I feel like the other the other thing that that like connects these plays that I was thinking about listening to it this time around is like how they relate to conflict or like don't relate to conflict or how the conflict that happens isn't like the traditional like conflict of like a piece of theater or movie or something that. Um, and I feel like in Canary, the conflict is like settled through like the dance off, which is like very arbitrary and nonviolent and um, weird. It like, like what does conflict look like when we're not, when violence or like domination isn't a part of the vocabulary, but we actually just equally have arbitrary ways of deciding things. But then in oracular therapy, we're like conflict well, there's moments of conflict, but the thing that drives the plot is the collaboration, um, which is like such this, I know we've talked about it, but just this amazing radical way of approaching storytelling, especially when like in directing 101, like the first thing they teach you is like find the conflict. Um, sometimes that's not what's happening. Yeah, so Abby, you directed Oracular Therapy, which Sam wrote obviously in case anyone hasn't been didn't read my beautiful title cards. Um, so do you do you two want to talk about that process? What has directing remotely been like? Ah, uh, um, really hard, <laughs> but also easy. Um, I'm not I'm not a very experienced director, so I always feel like I am eight years old uh, when I'm trying to do that. Uh, Ezekiel, who is here, probably also has some stuff to say about directing remotely because you've done a lot of that. But it's it's hard when you can't um, like like I'm not I don't really like go in for like a lot of the somatic uh, stuff. But I think there is something just like being in a room together that 
makes it a hell of a lot easier, um, obviously. And so finding solutions for how we can try to align our bodies across space um, is very challenging just in terms of the, some of those solutions have been like doing breathing exercises together, doing movement exercises together. Um, but yeah, reacting to each other's energy is very different. Uh, and so we tried to come up with very interesting solutions for that or ways of doing that. Um, I don't know what it was like to be directed by me. So Pira probably knows that better than I do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's strange. Yeah, so we have Pira who starred in oracular therapy and Ezekiel who has also done some directing remotely uh, during as part of did you, what did you direct? You directed the 24 hour theater here. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, start. Will you talk about um, directing remotely to begin? <laughs> sure, I will talk about directing remotely, but I also feel like an eight year old when I direct that relatable experience of imposter syndrome. Um, I think directing remotely, I do lean into the, like I do a lot of games and exercises in person as a director. Um, and I love them and that's not having that or like the figuring out ways to have that across like this virtual space is definitely I feel like the the biggest challenge of it to me more than even like finding more than the performance it's like how do you sort of create the process space digitally I think shorter rehearsals is part of it for me um like a three-hour block is like doable in person not on zoom the three hour rehearsals on zoom are too long like an hour to two hours i think it's like a cap for making it really work on zoom um like more shorter rehearsals consistency lots of space for people to check in about how they're doing because this is a pandemic that we're all living through and if you ignore that completely i feel like people won't be able to sort of open at all um to work together and those are my main thoughts right now. Um, I would love to talk about this more. So people who are out there in the listening world, if you're there, um, I have been wanting to have more discussions about how to direct remotely and would love to talk to anyone about this. Um, and as we keep sort of pressing forward in this journey. Um, yeah. Great answer. So Pira, will you talk about being directed remotely? <laughs> Yeah, um, it is also, it's super weird to be directed remotely. Um, and part of it is that like, like in person, the theater is a whole different space where like you have to, you know, I, I would bike half a mile and then, you know, get to the theater and, and you know, like go in and it's only people who are involved and like, and then, yeah, like you do the little exercises and it's a quiet room um, and no one interrupts you if you're lucky, uh, but like, for oracular therapy, I was, you know, okay, well, I will walk 20 feet to my bedroom and I'll close the door. And if there's dogs outside and they're barking, like, we'll just have to deal with that. Um, so it was like, just the the physical environment of it was just <laughs> so different um, from like kind of normal theater circumstances uh, where there was just like, there weren't really any boundaries between like theater world and like, the world of living in my mom's house um and also just like everything's distracting i've got my computer right in front of me like oh my god um but i i think it was still like you know it, it was super interesting and uh it was still good to you know only have people who were involved at least you know on my little screen um because we, we zoomed the whole time uh for for anyone out there who doesn't know how it worked uh, we had like, we were, the actors were recording ourselves on separate little uh, things, you know, like on our phones or, or whatever. And then we were also zooming with each other and then we would send the audio separately. Um, so it was, you know, we, we had a computer to look at, we could see each other um, and we could see the script, but it was just, like, it was pretty wild uh, acting experience. Yeah, I'd love to hear from um, Ash and Sean, if you have any additional uh, things to say about this, or Sam, who hasn't waited on this at all. Um, and then we have a question from the audience, so. 
I feel like um, one thing that's like an interesting and uh, like an interesting difference between like radio um, sort of editing for like uh, like a Zoom theater or like but or like radio theater for like an auditory experience and or, and like being involved in the, the process of it's like making an auditory experience is um, once for like in terms of like editing. Um, once things are in, like once I have all like the voice files from everyone in my in, in my computer, the sort of like both the um, the like sort of still exit like weight of the fact that the performers like weren't in space with each other, but they were in like they were reacting and like bouncing off each other, and that like means something different and like feels different like in the recording um, than if you are having people record things separately and then putting them together. Um, because there's a lot of like sort of space and in the way that like people talk to each other and the way that people react that you can certainly create and it's like like a whole like art to like create from people who weren't actually like acting off each other but like editing like an audio where people are acting off each other um you have to like be mindful and like respectful of that space and like honoring like the choices that the actors made um and then working around those choices working like with those choices to build the sort of like support to like that acting um, instead of like building something like from the ground up because you have this lovely like cool um, base to work with. Yeah, to that end, I absolutely think that um, audio editing and audio additions to an, a radio play is like the biggest advantage that we have right now in terms of creating work remotely and over Zoom. Uh, but I do something that was like cool to discover working on um, Sean's uh, like Div 3 thesis piece on Zoom, something that I really had to learn is like how energetically different it is. And so by the time we got to that opening night, it was like relearning how to act through a screen, um, which is like something I never learned how to do. My degree didn't prepare me for it, but Ezekiel is our director and guided us through that process. So. Uh, I think for people out there who are thinking about making work during this time remotely, like just trust yourself to find new ways to activate like similar parts of our brain. Like by opening night, I still had jitters in my like closet that I was acting out of. <laughs> um, so I, it's interesting the ways that we're able to sort of recreate the strength of live theater um, in that way. So I think we have a lot of advantages right now that I'm discovering and loving. Yeah, so our audience question uh, is related to this discussion. Um, so it's a great time to plug this in. Uh, Alana Kepler uh, said, how does the radio play formula influence your writing process? Now, obviously, as we've learned, these two plays were not written uh, when they were believed to be remote plays or radio plays. So, but also Theater Between Addresses has been doing workshops of new work and everyone is working on new things all the time. So how has your writing changed now that you may or may not, whether you're writing hopefully, uh, but if you're writing with radio plays in mind, what are you thinking differently? How are you thinking differently? <laughs> this is a, quest a question for anyone because I know you're all writing. I feel like one strength uh, or one like fun thing in um, radio uh, radio theater is like how Abby mentioned earlier in that that it feels like a bit like writing prose and like how you can do like you can construct like the set and the world with like bits of like prose um, that are would be the stage directions in like a non radio play but are really like crucial and like help the audience's understanding. Um, we workshopped a really lovely piece that Pira wrote the other week that like did a did just like worked with stage directions in a really like beautiful way that um, like lent itself to like the set dressing of like the audio world. Uh, Sam and then Abby. <laughs> yeah, I think one uh, strength of it um, for me is that you're not as limited by kind of 
you know, material reality, <laughs> you know, you can kind of write in whatever fantastical elements you want. And I feel like, you know, having done a lot of in-person theater, like one limitation of it is like, you know, both like what exists in the world and also like what your budgetary concerns are. So I think like, you know, it, it's nice to not have to kind of worry about like, oh, can my scrappy little theater like create this huge crazy set, you know, and just to be able to like write from that very free space, I think. And I, I mean, I've seen people do awesome stuff too with crazy descriptions, but I think that is nice to not have to worry about like, what is the materiality of this going to be? Um, and I also like that, um, you know, now radio plays are getting a lot more attention and like Zoom play is a whole new genre that I hope continues. And I think it's kind of cool. Um, thank you for coming, Alana. I'm really glad you're here. Um, I think that armchair play is like a dirty word in like theater world, like, cause like armchair play as in just like a play that you're supposed to just like sit around and read. But like, here we are on like all of our fucking armchairs. And um, I think that like the attention to stage directions is like really interesting. Cause like radio plays and medium, cause it, like I was adapting from Canary and like, but just like had to turn my stage directions into narration and like actually finding, cause I'm not someone who like pays attention to my stage directions, I tend to like approach them very like a utilitarian way, but like actually finding a voice for them and like finding a rhythm and like a personality and finding that with uh, actors is really cool. And then some of these people uh, in this group are people who like, when I have gone and seen their live theater, I'm thinking about like Samuel's thesis, um, sometimes in live theater, like this is a group of people who also likes to read their stage directions out loud. And it's like, um, so, it, and that also is like a part of the piece when it is in front of you is there's this narration component. And I think that's very interesting and like, I'm starting to just like be so interested in the, um, the dimension that adds. And yeah, writing for radio play and adapting for radio play, I find myself like adding characters that I didn't need when it was a live piece and like being able to add more characters because they don't have to worry about running out of space for all these people. Um, so yeah, such, such fun opportunities for our armchairs. I have one thought about this, um, which is just that the, it's sort of off of what Sam was saying, but like, I think there's a real capacity to have plays in a lot of different locations on the radio um, and not have to worry about set changes, which have traditionally been the bane of my existence. Um, and I love the, I love this sort of freedom of movement and like being able to imagine up lots of new spaces and sort of move. I don't know, I just was thinking about like how movies often have a lot more locations than stage plays and I think radio lets you have even more. You can have as many as you want. Um, and granted, like both of these plays were in sort of single discrete locations, maybe in part because they started before the idea of radio, but I thought the idea of radio existing. But um, I don't know, I'm excited by the idea of a play that could be like, doesn't have to be that long, but could be in a lot of different places. Because I think often there's like, oh, if we need three locations, we might as well have to be a three act play then. And I think I like the idea that like you could have lots of locations in a short time, like in real life when you travel from place to place sometimes, I guess before this, who knows? Anyway, that's my whole thought. Yeah, you could do like a, um, a road trip play. And we did that when we did the 24 hour thing. With the, that was one that I, I wrote for Zoom. And then we had the Hall of Mirrors because I, I knew that you would have fun with that Ezekiel just setting up cameras <laughs> for zooming and then it looked very cool so i feel like yeah we have in this group written for zoom specifically or adapted for zoom it's a good effect yes so um i'm trying to think of what el what else we could dig into because both of these plays have so many have like are rich with themes as one might say um in a way that's maybe less here's some things that i want to touch on Hmm. 
excuse me for how casual I'm being with this. I'm just trying, there's just so much to do and there's so many people and we have so many great people to talk and so many great things to say. Um, how, about we how about we talk about sound design? Uh, Sean, will you, because the sound design on both of these is incredible. Um, and oracular therapy in particular, like they're both great, but I was really struck by especially the beginning, like something about the panic attack when it first hits you is so impactful. Um, so I wanted to hear about your process, uh, particularly with these plays, but also since you've done it before, if you want to just speak broadly, it would be great. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, I'm really glad you liked that aspect of, of oracular therapy. Um, that was one of the, like, a part that was really fun to design for. I, um, I have uh, only been doing uh, audio design for about a year. I actually picked it up to um, work on a radio play, a series of short radio plays that um, me and my like writing partner wrote together last year. And then I started like learning it um, out of the necessity of editing those. Um, and finding out that it's really fun. Um, but I uh, particularly in, in, I like to do things that bring the audience like into the world um, in ways that wouldn't necessarily be, that ways that like, I guess, aren't necessarily like literal, always like literal interpretations of like the physical world that the characters exhibit, but are also like interpretations of their like internal worlds. Um, so Sam had given me a note um, when I started working on oracular therapy about the therapist's office, like the ways that it might sound and like, oh, there like might be a white noise machine or a fan or something like that. And I was thinking about like the experience of like having a panic attack or the experience of like dealing with like these memories and like thoughts that are really, really, really distressing and how nightmarish that is and how like things and like sounds in your environment like when you're experiencing like that much like fear can be like really overwhelming and like it can kind all of, like tangle up into like this horrible like mush of, of like sensation and so that was something that I wanted to um, bring across with uh, or the editing and oracular therapy and with the um, sort of rise of the white noise and something that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Do you have any other favorite moments that you worked on in each of these? Yeah, I'm really proud of the Dance Dance Revolution um, bit in uh, The Canary. And I'm also really uh, happy with um, the ocean noises and the music in Canary and how they like hold hands. Um, I, uh, all of the sound effects that I use, I get from freesound.org, which is this really cool community of people who just like record things and put them online. Most of the things are free to use. Um, uh, and it's just, you can find like so much, you can find music that people write and just like put up there, um, which is where all the, all the music and book um, things came from. But just like going through the archives and like finding the perfect sounds is like really, really cool. <laughs> and I really admire the people who um, put their like time into just recording random shit. Yeah, so sort of jumping off of that, a question for both Sam and Abby, um, and maybe Pira too, uh, from the acting perspective, I guess, when, before you heard the sound design version, the official radio play version of each of these, what did you think it would sound like? Like, what did you, and how did it differ between your imagination and the reality, especially considering that these are both sort of intended to be stage plays? Anyone can start. There's no. <laughs> Maybe this is a hard question. Sam, you wanna go? No, I, I kind of feel like um, one of the things I love the most about playwriting is that it's never what I imagined. <laughs> like it's it's always like other people always add something new to it. Like once other people are introduced to the process and it's never exactly what was in my head. And that's what I find very exciting about it because other people like bring their creativity to it and add things that um, I couldn't have pictured. And I think in some ways, I think oracular therapy I really like that it's an audio play now because I do sometimes feel like 
I don't know. I feel like the impact of Cassandra's words are a lot more powerful than it would be necessarily. Um, and it is so much about words and the message she's trying to deliver. So I think, you know, it's not what I imagined, but in some ways it's, uh, you know, become something different. And I think that's great. I think, yeah, it's, it's hard. I, I like, I have now heard um, the radio version like 20 times. So I like, it's hard to remember um, what we were imagining, but also it's like, it's stuff that like, I think there was like a bigger difference between like reading it and imagining what it would sound like and then like recording it. Like that was a huge difference than once like it was recorded and we'd been through it than like what actually came about because I think of course Sean was also working with what the actors were putting down. And like, I mean like Carrot like also just like brought all this like cool stuff with the therapist and like perspective on like, she had something to say about like Irish mythology and how that was like kind of built in and like the therapist became Irish and like that was this other dimension. Um, and yeah, I lived just like the, the attitude is like Cassandra throughout and, um, yeah, I like that even in a different media, like that process of discovery and like kind of questioning that I feel like is is foundational to my style of directing, which is like just ask questions until you're sick of it. Um, like just got really cool ideas from that and created a really cool soundscape just from like basing off the actors. The, ther the person who plays a the therapist sounds like Isabella Rossellini, I just have to say. Has anyone else felt that way? No? Who is that? Oh, um, I'll send you stuff after this. <laughs> she's an actress, but she has a very specific voice and it was I couldn't get it out of my head the entire time. Um, okay, so let's talk big themes a little bit. Um, We've been talking for like half an hour. If everyone's cool with going for another half an hour, we don't have to, but um, we can, you know, half an hour, 15 minutes. Anyway, um, so let's talk about, both of these sort of deal with like, both of these involve impossible ethical questions that I feel like many of us feel we have been in the position of having to answer for ourselves, but also probably haven't. Um, particularly like, uh, well, no, but for, as far as Cassandra, I feel like a lot of people, especially right now, sort of feel like they have the, you know, they've been on Reddit or collapse for a very long time and they know the civil war is coming kind of thing, you know? And like the, so the, these are ethical questions that we can imagine asking, but maybe can't imagine answering. Um, yeah, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, the idea of like a message beacon um, and having to decide whether or not it should be shared. I guess I don't know. Let's let's just talk. Let's just be philosophical about both of these. What are the connections you see between them? I see my connections. You see yours. Um, yeah, just jump just jump in. Thank you for. Bearing with me. <laughs> Ash, go ahead. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about since listening to these pieces is uh, like inevitability and something that is something that felt very resonant to our current situation, even though both of these pieces were written, started pre-pandemic. Um, there's something about in Canary, the idea of receiving a message, the, the, the moment when they're discussing how long it took for the message to get to them, that it takes like over three years, that it's already too late to do anything about this apocalypse you're hearing about. There's something to that that resonates with maybe uh, the experience of a therapist, an oracular therapy, who is hearing this inevitable sounding, if it's true, then is it possible to avert? And if it's not true, then what can we do? Then what, then there's nothing to do, sort of this question of how does an individual, maybe this is my question for myself, how does an individual deal with 
the knowledge of something that you might feel powerless to change. So I thought both of these explored those feelings in a way that felt very resonant. Don't know if I got an answer, but that's, I guess, just the 2020 uh, experience. <laughs> Yeah, and also like, I feel like both the character of Cassandra and the character of, is it Toba? Is that? Yeah, it's Toba. Toba, yeah, yeah. Toba. Yeah, yeah. The Toba yeah. I feel like they both. I feel like they both have information that is essentially blips, like visuals. And then they're both incredibly confident in their interpretation of those visuals and the fact that they have like a call to answer in a way. Um, so I think it says something about, uh, you know, the nature of, of gaining maybe apocalyptic prophetic information and, and feel like taking on that as a responsibility that then sort of becomes an ethical identity in a way, instead of, you know, the, I, I don't know. I love the process of the idea of the process of like sitting with a therapist whose job it is to tell you what to do with information that at the end, she also doesn't really know what to do with. Um, yeah. I don't know. Does anyone have any other connections between these two that they'd like to share? Uh, we don't have any other, um, we don't have any other questions from the audience, except does anyone have a therapist from Abby Weaver fan 666? Um, <laughs> I don't right now, but I am looking for a new one. So if anybody has any great recommendations out there, I would up on that. Um, yes. That is all. Therapist recommendations in the chat. Pira, you were going to say something? Go ahead. Um, yeah. When we were rehearsing oracular therapy, I thought a lot about how it was sort of about like both the strengths and weaknesses of therapy as a solution in terms of like, like Cassandra, like her, her, Cassandra's problem is not that she feels powerless. The problem is that she literally is powerless and that no one is listening to her, which therapy can't fix. And so she's addressing her feelings of powerlessness, but that won't actually address the problem um, and so I was just, it, it made me think about like, like therapy as an individual action, which does not actually address the root of like that particular uh, trouble and addressing the root of that particular trouble is demonstrably impossible, which is part of the trouble. And so just like, it's thinking about how individual action like isn't enough, but collective action it will never happen <laughs> um, in the in the world of that play, uh, and certainly like how I think that is also a little bit present in Canary. Although this is the first time that I've listened to it or read it, so um, I would need to like sit with it a little more. But uh, yeah, it's just sort of a a bummer situation <laughs> um, that's just infuriating and crazy making. So uh, is he killed in Sam? I just have more thoughts about therapy because it's something that I think about a lot and have had chunks of with different therapists. And I think that there's like something really interesting in the like, mm, like therapy primarily being like an internal solution of like, how do you deal with things internally? And also sometimes how do you make tools to deal with things externally? But that like on some level, I guess what's so fascinating is like any, you can, like, I feel like it's not almost that there's like internal problems and external problems. It's like that there are problems and they need solutions sometimes both internally and externally. Like Cassandra is not going to be able to like solve the fact that no one will listen to her, but she can like figure out how to sort of be in a better relationship with herself about it in a way that I think is really important. And so that there's something really interesting in that. Also just in the like tie of, I've been thinking about the question about like interpretation from earlier still and like that sort of thinking about like therapy. Okay, this is too much of a galaxy brain thought maybe, but like mm, something about like therapy and like theater creation as both like questioning arts and interpretive arts and like they're both sort of centered around 
asking questions and like sort of building your own subjective understanding of something um, or like a group subjective understanding. I don't know. I'm just like, I think therapy is fascinating. And I think that the way that it comes up in these, this piece is fascinating. And I wish I could see what would happen if the therapist from Oracular Therapy was on the Canary ship, because I feel like that would like change everything in really interesting ways. Yeah, so Sam and then Abby, and then I have one closing question. So. Yeah, I think um, one thing that came up a lot that kind of uh, Pira touched on while we were in this process with oracular therapy was, um, you know, I was having a lot of conversations with my therapist that were essentially like, yeah, this is a terrible situation. I don't really know what to do either. You know, like very humanizing moments with my therapist. And I was thinking about some of that, which uh, kind of, the end of oracular therapy actually was a later edition that happened while we were rehearsing over Zoom. Um, Cause I was kind of thinking about that and how I was often having these moments of thinking like, my therapist probably doesn't know what to do either. He probably also feels this way. Um, I don't know, that might just me be me projecting, but I, I think it's a pretty uh, safe to assume projection. <laughs> um. Um, I invited my therapist to watch this, uh, but I don't know if she's here because I forgot to remind her uh, when I saw her last week. So, um, yeah, I don't know if she's here, but it, um, yeah, because I feel like when I read it, I was like, oh, this is the conversation I have with my therapist every week about how I absolutely am convinced that the world is ending because of climate change. Um, and then it, it always comes to like, okay, but what can you control? And then it just like, we go in these circles and it takes 20 go rounds and an hour to be like, okay, it's gonna sink in. And that's something I know we talked about in the workshop and in rehearsal, but it's something that, um, that I think that this play is incredibly radical in terms of the dramatic structure, not being like dee 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 dee. dee. Um, and it's just this huge circle of like going around and processing and like, this collaboration where just, it's just something that's being built on over time. And I think the assertion that those kind of dynamics and those kind of conversations um, and that kind of action, the assertion that that is theatrical and the assertion that that is dramatic is incredibly radical and like is so affirming of these things that aren't these like just kind of great stories of very simple like thesis antithesis in our lives and um yeah it's just incredibly experimental and effective in that way so go sam oh thanks Abby. <laughs> that's so sweet <laughs> yeah these are both incredible first radio plays to come out of Theater Between Addresses and incredible additional plays to come out of two incredible playwrights and actors and directors and teams of thoughtful, wonderful, creative people. Um, so my final question is, what's next? Where can the people find you? Uh, what should they be ready for coming up? And where should they donate? Um, so anyone who wants to update? You can connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. We are Theater Between Addresses. So those are two great social media ways you can keep updated about um, our next works. So check us out there. And if people wanna get involved, if they have plays to workshop, they should contact through social media and they it's Wednesday workshops, Wednesday night workshops, um, where a team of wonderful people will come and read your work with you and potentially maybe we'll become a radio play. Um, and there are, Abby, how many other radio plays are currently in the works to eventually be released? Ah, um, as you know, there are, <laughs> you know, because, um, because Liz is doing some beautiful editing on them, in fact, um, there are two up and coming radio plays also by me um, that I think we're going to aim for a Halloween release. I don't know. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens, but there will be more. Um, 
Canary and Oracular Therapy will both be available on podcast if someone missed it or wants to listen again. Uh, and those will be available on our social media. We'll let you know how to get them, I think, eventually. I don't know. I mean, who knows what could happen tomorrow. Um, Sean probably knows more about that. Uh, and coming up, there will probably be more, more things that we're recording and more Zoom plays that we'll be producing. I don't know. Um, but I do know that I think if you're still with us to the very end of this talk back um, and really enjoyed this, you should go to givebutter.com slash T-A-S-S-N and donate um, either a one-time donation or monthly to the Trans Asylum Seeker Support Network, um, with whom many of our friends are involved in that and are doing incredible work and peer-to-peer -peer support and really, really essential help for people who really need it. So. Yay. Yes, calling all actors, calling all writers, donate your money, contribute to mutual aid, and contribute to theater and art and creation and prophecy. So thank you, Theater Between Addresses, for joining me on Focus Locus Presents. This was an experiment of, of a non-film thing, and it was Wonderful and so great to talk to all of you. Um, and I am going to sign us off of live in three, two, one.